Aloha, everyone. I'm your host, Christina Laney Mitri, and welcome to Smart Living Hawaii's podcast, where we discuss smart homes and technology, sustainability, healthy lifestyles, and smart business. Today, we'll continue our Sustainable Leaders series and have a talk story with Stuart Coleman, the Executive Director of Y, Waste, Water, Alternatives, and Innovations. We will go over cesspools and failing septic tanks and how they harm our oceans and drinking water. If you know nothing about what I just said, keep listening or watching, and you will learn so much more in under an hour and hopefully feel compelled to share this with others. So aloha, Stuart. Aloha, good to see you. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, as always, I'd like to begin with um, a little bio on our guest speaker. So today, um, I'm gonna introduce you to Stuart Holmes Coleman. He is a writer, speaker, environmental advocate. He is um, the award-winning author of three books, by the way. Eddie Would Go is one of them, as we all know. Um, Fierce Heart and Eddie Aikau, um, the Hawaiian hero. And the recipient of the Elliot Cades Award for Literature. As a keynote speaker, Coleman has given talks about Hawaiian history and culture, environmental issues, transformational leadership, and sustainable development at events in Hawaii, um, across the United States and in Costa Rica and China and places like that as well. As the former Hawaii pollution, wait, as the former Hawaii manager of the Surfrider Foundation, he has passed landmark laws to reduce plastic pollution create smoke-free beaches and parks and protect the water quality. After being selected as uh, an Omidia, is it Omidia? It's an Omidia, Omidia right? Yeah. yeah. Um, fellow in 2018, Coleman went on to create an environmental nonprofit called Y, which is what we're gonna be discussing today. So that's where he serves as the executive, executive director and he'll definitely go into more with us soon. So let's dive in. Um, background, let's start there. What's your background um, growing up? Uh, are you from here? When did you move here? Things like that in your family. Yes, so I grew up on the East Coast in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and I took a course in the seventh grade, a mandatory course called Cultures of the Pacific. Um, it turned out the, the teacher was also the principal so he could enforce these kind of courses. And he had been a soldier in the Pacific theater during World War II. And so I learned all about Hawaii at a young age and started surfing around the same time. So I dreamed of moving to Hawaii uh, one day and finally made good on that um, when I became a teacher um, and got a job here out at Punahou. Um, wow. And then, yeah. How long ago was that? Do you mind me asking? Ooh, it was a long time ago. Uh, I'm going to betray my age, but uh, it was uh, over 25 years ago. Okay. Uh, yeah. And um, I know that you've taken up surfing. Was that something you did back home as well? Or was it something you started when you got here? Yeah, no, I uh, started surfing there, kind of the small Minnehaha waves on the East Coast, except for hurricane surf when it would get really big. Uh, and then, yeah, continued Surfing was kind of my hidden agenda and in, in moving to Hawaii, um, but teaching was the, the way that it paid the way. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so your family's all here now or is everybody still far away from you or? Yeah, unfortunately we're kind of spread out uh, across uh, the, the mainland and, uh, um, but my wife and I live here. Yeah, and, um, and uh, one of the best compliments I ever received was um, a big Hawaiian guy, you know, told me after I wrote Eddie would go um, that before I was just a mainland Haole and he said after he was now I'm a local Haole. And I was like, <laughs> All right, I'll take it. <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see. So I guess with your passion for surfing and the ocean, that's what led you into this sustainable world. What were you teaching at Punahou? So I uh, taught literature and creative writing. Okay. Yeah. So I know just for the listeners, um, <laughs> there might have to be a little bit of um, repeating if our um, internet has technical difficulties. <laughs> so I will 
I may ask him to repeat if I can't hear him. So in regards to, let's see, how you got into, I guess with Surfrider, was that kind of the first start of the sustainable world of what you're doing now? Yeah, so I volunteered with the Surfrider Foundation uh, for about uh, eight or nine years and then helped create the first uh, Hawaii manager position here. Um, and so worked with them for 11 years. And then um, two years ago, I started my own nonprofit, Vi, um, which as you know, is Vi is the Hawaiian word for water. And that's kind of the, the heart of what we do about water quality. Um, but it also stands for wastewater alternatives and innovations. Yeah, and their website is cute because it's kind of, they're very punny. <laughs> so um, their website is whycleanwater.org, correct? So um, yeah. kind of like the W-H-Y, I'm assuming. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of things like that you'll notice on the website is kind of cute. Um, yeah. In I wanted to kind of dive into um, what you guys cover, what you guys do at Vi and how, um, what your mission, vision, and then I've noticed kind of like the areas of focus. Um, maybe you can dive into that um, yes. for your nonprofit. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, um, we have five pillars or programs and um, that's innovative technology and then pilot projects to get those in the ground which I don't want to introduce Hawaii to some very innovative sanitation technology. Um, and then we have um, financial resources to help homeowners with cesspool conversion process. Um, and uh, then we have policy and advocacy to try to change laws to help that move forward. So we have better sanitation. And then finally, um, education and public outreach to the community. Um, but our underlining goal is water quality. Um, as you know, you can see in the background of our uh, Zoom screens, we're, you know, Hawaii, we're just surrounded by water and it's, you know, it's such a beautiful place that we have to protect and sewage from cesspools is one of the largest, you know, contaminants um, to, to water quality. And so I had worked on water quality issues for years at Surfrider Foundation. And then we started realizing that cesspools were one of the largest contributors. So we helped pass three laws. Um, and, and that's how I really kind of realized, okay, there's, there was a need to create a nonprofit dedicated to helping people with this issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's dive into that. Let's, I mean, you're, you've been very active with the ledge and actually successful in passing a lot of these, um, not only with the cesspools, but also with Surfrider, because I know there's a lot um, that are very innovative things that the state of Hawaii has done that you guys have passed. Um, the next goal is enforcing them, right? <laughs> um, in regards to cesspools, though, could you explain the three different um, ones that you've worked on and how they, yeah. how, they, how they work, I guess, for us, right? Yeah, and then just to really kind of make sure we start at the basics, Maybe we'll talk about what a cesspool is because there's sometimes a lot of confusion um, about that. So a cesspool is basically just a hole in the ground um, that's often lined with bricks or concrete rings. Um, sometimes not, sometimes it's literally just a hole in the ground and it's where all the wastewater from the house goes. So that's everything from your showers, your sinks, your dishwashers, your washing machines um, and your toilets. And so, that basically goes into the ground and then just percolates down into the groundwater with no treatment whatsoever. And it's different from the, so it's like the most basic crude style of treatment. It's totally outmoded. It's not allowed in any of the 50 states anymore. Um, we were the last state to ban them. And that was one of the laws that we created in 2016, banning the construction of new cesspools. Um, but a septic tank is where you have like a septic tank first where all the wastewater goes and it's held and the solids kind of sink to the bottom and then everything else goes into a leach field. And so there's some treatment, microbial treatment that happens in the leach field. 
where they start to eat away at the, you know, the waste products. It's kind of a really fascinating, it's a natural system, you know, um, that nature kind of provides, but it doesn't take care of all the, the nutrients. Um, and those are things like nitrogen and phosphorus that are a natural part of human waste. Um, and that goes into the groundwater and then goes out and eventually ends up in streams, sometimes in drinking water and our coastal waters. And that's very dangerous. Um, there are many kind of environmental and public health risks associated with those. So does it, heavy rains and anything like that affect these, um, the, the systems and everything or just yeah. getting into the ocean and everything? Yeah, and so you're, you're spot on. Like the, the two major kind of sources of contamination for water quality are stormwater runoff after we have a heavy rain. Mm -hmm. And that just takes all the chemicals and heavy metals from cars, oils, fertilizers, dog waste and everything. And it goes into you know, storm drains and then directly out to sea. But part of that is also, it'll inundate, it'll flood the, the cesspools. Mm -hmm. And so then also you get a lot of waste that goes out. Um, and so those are the two largest sources, but even in stormwater, there's cesspool waste in that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so it goes out and in some areas across the state, like um, in parts of the east side of Oahu and then upcountry Maui, we're seeing elevated levels of nitrogen um, from the waste that are ended up in drinking water. And so oh. that's when we realized we had a real, a real problem. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2016, we passed a law to ban the construction of new cesspools. And then in uh, the next year we passed a so law. So they were actually still making cesspools and that was yeah. fine and people were okay with that? Yeah, in we were the 2015 last- 2015 or 16? Unbelievable. We were the last state by decades to still allow them. Most states had banned them decades ago. I mean, I'm uh, visualizing a porter potty and it's just basically like that's what's cool i mean and you you know how disgusting those are to just like yeah. go into i'm just thinking that's all that's happening going right into the ground <laughs> yes, what I'm exactly. <laughs> we, we uh you know as you can tell by my background i've got these two toilets that we put on a beach and my friend Raphael from sustainable coastlines uh took this photo just as a psa to remind people that you know, cesspools near the coast are literally like toilets on the beach. You know, it literally ends up in our waters. Um, and so we kind of, you know, you have to have a sense of humor about it because it's nobody likes to talk about these issues, but it's a very serious issue. And so that's why we were like, okay, we've got to tackle this because we have 88,000 cesspools across Hawaii um, and we have the most per capita in the whole entire country. And they release 53 million gallons of raw untreated waste into our ground and groundwater every single day. It's crazy. And that is mind boggling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And then from my understanding, we have about 11,000 here on Oahu. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Now on their website, they have the islands and kind of show with, with red colors of um, where where they're, is it where they're located or where um, the most risk is? Uh, uh, where they're located. Yeah, okay. Which is also associated with the most risk. And, yeah. Yeah. And um, it's pretty alarming to know this. And I think a lot of people don't really know anything about it because I think for the most part, a lot of people are now just on a sewer system. So, um, and if they're not, these systems don't, um, like a cesspool doesn't require you to be hooking up to a company that comes and pumps it out. So then you don't really think about it then either, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. It's just always there, right? So um, the education on this to everybody is key. But um, now the next question is, well, why aren't we doing something about this, right? Or why is not everybody doing something about this? And why is it not getting done? Um, I think the biggest issue is price, right? It's expensive to do this. So maybe we can tackle that. Um, I would really like to hear some of um, 
some of the solutions that we have done, because I know there's been a credit, um, and then what, what kind of things we're thinking about to help with the 88,000 <laughs> that yeah, we still have yeah. to tackle, right? Well, and just to kind of finish that thought, because um, I was rambling before, but you know, the, the, the most important thing is the second law that we passed was banning all cesspools by 2050. So that's in the books. And the third law we helped pass was the creation of the cesspool conversion working group. So the State Department of Health put this together. I serve on that. And we're trying to figure out a plan and ways to get rid of all these cesspools in the next three decades. Um, but if we started today with about 90,000 cesspools, that's more than 3,000 conversions that we have to do each year for mm -hmm. the next 30 years. Um, so we are currently doing about 150 to 200 conversions a year. So we really? have a long way to go. Yeah, we have to amplify that by about 20 times. So when you uh -huh. had the $10,000 credit towards someone who were to, so this expired, could you yeah. explain that a little bit to everybody? Yeah, so part of, you know, one of those laws we created um, a uh, tax break, um, a $10,000 tax credit. It wasn't, it didn't roll out the way we'd hoped. We wanted to model it after the solar tax credits where mm -hmm. companies could take these $10,000 tax credits and then help homeowners pull them together with the conversion. So then they take care of everything. They do the paperwork, they do the contracting and for low income people, they probably don't have to pay anything at all. Um, and so it was a really good model, you know, that other states have used, but they ended up, ended up making it individual tax credits to the homeowners. But most homeowners don't know what to do with a $10,000 tax credit because they don't owe that much. And so for individuals, it really wasn't that affected. We only had, you know, like uh, maybe 200 people take advantage of it over five years. So we want to try to bring that mm -hmm. back and again, revise it so it becomes like the solar tax credit where the companies are incentivized to get involved and help out homeowners because right. they and want then those tax credits. They're even, um, they have loan options, right? Um, to where that can be an option mm -hmm. as well for people, which makes it still feasible to, mm -hmm. to do. So yeah. um, I think that's a great idea. And I think we should yeah. definitely go down that road because yeah. there is a lot that are still on the list. Um, I, I did sell, I mean, for within real estate anyways, um, there are 11,000 homes, I guess, here that still have them. And, um, you know, every now and then you come across one here on Oahu, but, you know, talking to agents in um, neighboring islands where it's much more, um, like they have way less homes uh, in general, but more of them already are uncessful. So um, they deal with it every day. A lot of our agents may not even come across it. And some of them um, are selling these homes and are completely unaware. And if they are not doing their due diligence or their clients aren't. And then they are now stuck with um, <laughs> right this cesspool that they're unaware of. And then um, pricing wise, would you say it runs around thirty to fifty thousand, or how? Yeah. What would you What would you say? It's It's tough because it really depends on each specific site, you know, because it, the slope of the property, the size of the property, the kind of soil they have on the property, how many bedrooms they have in the home. So there are a lot of really very specific criteria that you can put on, but. We created a potty portal, um, again, because we love puns, um, on our website, which is uh, waivicleanwater.org. And it kind of walks homeowners through each step, like what kind of home do they have? What's the you know size of the place? How many bedrooms? And then you can kind of see what your options are. And they range anywhere from, you know, the most basic kind of just going from a cesspool to a septic system the septic tank in leach field, you know, could be like maybe 20,000 at the lowest. And then if you're near the coast in a small plot and it's shallow, it's very, uh, you know, not very deep to the groundwater table, then you're going to have to spend, you know, much more money for an aerobic treatment unit, you know, because it has to produce much high, higher quality waste because the water's right there. 
And those, and those are up. mandated, like that's what they have to do for those units. Uh, in those certain units. areas, yeah, where they're near the water table, um, near the coast, where it can leach out into or a stream or a well, mm -hmm. um, uh, or yeah, an injection, you know, uh, they have um, areas where you can have above um, the certain injection well line where you, then you, if you're above an aquifer, for instance, in certain areas, then you have to have even more of a, a system that makes wow. sure that none of that water seeps into our aquifer and affects our drinking water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I guess I'm interested to hear some of the innovative products because I know that this is a goal of yours to tackle all these cesspools, but being in the sustainable world and green building, I'm also very interested in these innovative technologies because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people doing off the grid work. I don't know if you've heard of earth ships and all these different really crazy cool um, things that people are building these days um, right. where it's like, you know, net positive homes and, um, you know, not being on a system at all. And um, the water that comes out from my understanding is practically drinking water, but people usually just water plants with it. <laughs> I mean, um, like all of those kinds of things. And what are our options these days here for yeah. the people that I guess can't afford this type of innovation? Yeah. And partly that's why I got motivated because I was invited with Senator Chris Lee to speak at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they had a thing called the Reinvented Toilet Expo in Beijing. <laughs> and they wanted us to talk about the situation in Hawaii. And we just got a glimpse into the future. And we realized, he said, like, you know, he when he started out, you know, we had computers that were the size of rooms, supercomputers. And he had a dream to have like, a, you know, a personal computer that you could hold in your hand. And people thought he was crazy. Well, he kind of realized that sanitation is one of the largest pe public health issues in the world. Um, and so, you know, literally billions of people don't have access to clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that he realized like, oh, we've got to do something about. It. We're still using a system that's basically 150 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and we've learned so much. And so seeing these things was like, a, again, seeing the future um, and it's going to be better for all of us because it's going to conserve drinking water. It's going to recycle all the nutrients. Um, but like starting at the very home level, we have what's called an Cinderella incineration toilet. And uh, it's a waterless toilet that can, it looks just like a regular toilet. You can put it in your home. But like if you're off the grid, like you were saying, and a leach field and septic system costs, you know, $20,000 minimum you can buy one of these toilets and just right there, it's a complete unit in itself. They have electric models and gas models, and then it just incinerates all the waste and produces this harmless, 100% pathogen-free ash that you can put in a trash can or in your garden. So, so we have that at the home level, yeah. It's a, like, do you take it? It just does it on its own, like the system itself, or do you have to take it and put it somewhere no there. it just it drops into like a a bowl at the bottom you know you you put a um like a bowl liner in there and then you just close it it automatically drops off into the thing it's completely sealed and contained and it incinerates it and you have an exhaust pipe going out the back um and there's no smells and it you know completely reduces all the waste um so, you know, like 95% reduction. Um, so that's revolutionary. And that has really taken Can off. Can you make energy off of that? No. Um, there are larger models that we are working on, you know, that, that can't, you can make energy out of. Um, that's the newest, <laughs> the latest and greatest thing. Yeah. That this is the sort of uh, source of a lot of biogas. I mean, know, we that, have, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of puns so in there. They're, whether it's liquefied or solid, it'll do this, right? Do I'm assuming right. that's what you're saying. Right. All right. And how much and is the, a system like that? That's like uh, 4,500, um, you know, and we've done like- It's 20, like a per toilet kind of thing. Yeah. And we've done, yeah. you know, at least 20, 
four systems around and we can't keep up with demand. People want this. Um, and people who are the first ones, like we did one at HIMB in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, because they're scientists. They wanted to check this out and make sure it worked. And they know that sewage pollution in the Bay, in Kaneohe Bay, really had a disastrous, disastrous effect for years and years. So they wanted to try this out and they loved it. They bought another one. We have them on farms in the North Shore. They wow, bought a second yeah, right? one. Homeowners in rural areas, government agencies that have comfort stations on trails. Uh, and they the live, um, I mean, they they not live, but they work off of what kind of energy? is. So you can either use propane, you can have propane gas tanks that they operate on, or if you have electricity in your home, you can um, plug it in, yeah. Does it use a lot of electricity? Uh, you know, it's, uh, we're, Hawaii has the highest energy, you know, rates in the country. It's three mm -hmm. times the usual weight, but we figured it was like, you know, maybe 40 cents for each incineration, if that. Um, and do you then, do it every single time or just like when you go number two? Yes, um, usually every single time. Um, but uh, yeah, like um, you, you can sometimes, you know, wait, but generally every single time. Yeah. Interesting. I guess if you have um, a solar system on your house with ample <laughs> and you're using yeah. the restroom during the daytime. <laughs> yeah. And we're, they're working on that. It's a Norwegian uh, company and they're just amazing. They're having to build a whole new factory because international de demand is skyrocketed, especially during COVID because the virus can be transmitted through wastewater. And so people realize like, oh, we need to make sure this is hundred percent you know, uh, elimination of all pathogens. And oh. so it's really taken off, um, but they're working on kind of more solar models and, uh, you know, uh, higher efficiency ones. Um, so it's a very cool company to work with because um, it's just, for some people, there was no other option. If you live way mm -hmm. off the grid and you can't do a sanitation system, like this is perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And we won a Kauai Innovation Grant to um, convert a home that's on cesspools and then convert all the toilets to these incineration toilets and then do a gray water recycling um, system there. Because us also, it saves water. We need to get war more water back in the ground to recharge our aquifers. Um, yeah, so then, could we talk a little bit more about the, I guess, gray water systems that you guys yeah. have as well? So. Your company or nonprofit, should I say, um, provides these installments as well, or do you just partner with other companies to install? Or is that part yeah. of what you guys do or no? Yeah, we just partner with other like innovative um, providers. And part of our mission is just to introduce new technology to people and incentivize businesses to adapt these things. Because our goal is just we want to reduce sewage pollution in right. our waters and make sure that we don't affect our drinking water. Um, and so we realize that we're still operating on very outmoded systems. And so people, you know, they love gadgets and new technology. And so we just thought, okay, this is a great way to introduce things. And some of them were pioneering. So people across the country are looking to Hawaii now Mm -hmm. So even though we were last place with the number of cesspools and such, people are also saying, wow, they're doing some really innovative stuff in Hawaii. Because um, they have so many conversions that need to yes, take place, right? Exactly. So I guess everybody working on toilets and wastewater management is coming to Hawaii, which I see, you know, actually for a lot of things in sustainability for different reasons. I mean, yeah. just because um, the innovation um for Hawaii to become sustainable and the goals that are in place um, have is bringing a lot of business here, I feel, mm -hmm. in, in areas that we haven't been used to. And yes. um, I mean, I think we all welcome it because it's going to help our community and help, you know, get us to our goals. So I think it's awesome. And um, there's, you know, a lot of opportunity for venture capitalists, I would say, too, in this mm -hmm. area. And I hope to connect them with a lot of people like yeah. you um, in all the different sectors as well. So yeah. with and that said. Room for, 
you know, one of the most exciting things is we have a, a program called Work for Water. And we launched this during the pandemic because we realized, you know, Hawaii is so dependent on tourism that when the pandemic hit, we went from previously we had the lowest unemployment rate in the country to afterwards we had one of the highest rates in the entire country mm -hmm. because we were so dependent on tourism. So we're trying to diversify the workforce. So we created this work for water program to, you know, promote 400 cesspool conversions across the state um, using innovative new technologies. Um, and it will create, you know, eventually we think that this will create up to 2000 green jobs. And these are jobs that are well-paying, they're stable. Mm -hmm. So unlike construction or tourism that where they have the, you know, rise and fall and dips during recessions, this is very, very steady work and it pays well. Um, and you can start anywhere from high school level, you know, up to, we need engine, wastewater engineers, and more of those in the state. And so it's a really, you know, we're excited because it's job creation, a lot of small businesses when you have pump trucks and just installations like this is going to create a lot of work and put a lot of money into the economy. And with the, you know, the current administration's emphasis on um, infrastructure, including water and wastewater, mm -hmm. there's a lot of federal money that's going to become available. And so we want Hawaii to take advantage of that, bring in this federal money, a lot of its grants and some of its low cost loans, and really let's stimulate the economy, diversify it and create great jobs for people, um, you know, in, in this sector. So um, could we explain a little bit more on septic? Because you were going into the leaching. Mm -hmm. um, then there's also, I'll never forget this. And I'm totally going to see this on here, but I tried to look for it online. I lived in Maui like 20 years ago for a few years and there was this commercial and I don't know if the company still exists but um it was the most funniest commercial and I think it was on septic tanks but there was these girls and they were like um it was like who are you gonna call suck, suck them up pump in suck them up pump in and it was like this like um such a, che a cheesy like commercial but it was like the funniest thing and it had like the Ghostbusters theme but it was where they would come and I guess clean out your septic tanks, I'm assuming. At the time, I didn't really know anything about it. But um, so some need to be cleaned out or sucked yeah. out because it's too full. Could you explain that process? I think yeah. some people don't know because if you're not, if they're not full, then you don't and some require yeah. it and then some have filtration systems that make the gray water. Right. So that kind of explanation. Helps. Yeah, exactly. This is our kind of wastewater 101 talk where you know, your parents had to talk with you about, you know, sex <laughs> the when you younger. And, <laughs> and, uh, and nobody ever tells you about wastewater. It's flush and forget, and you don't even want to think Where about it, it at all. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, if you think about it, it's one of the biggest, you know, issues that we have, and we need to deal with it well, especially because we live in, you know, on an island and a series of islands. So um, basically, when you have everything go into a septic tank, and there you have settling. And so the solids settle to the bottom and then the, the liquids, when they rise up, they go out um, from the septic tank into a leach field. And so the leach field is where it's dispersed over this leach field and it goes to the soil and you have a mixture of sand and you have chambers in there that treat and basically take care of the waste. Now the uh, leach field is something that you like it's like part of your lawn and you have like yeah. end up growing grass over it and exactly. it doesn't you don't notice it but it's there correct exactly. okay yep. yeah and so um and you know there are a lot of these across hawaii that aren't really functioning well um because they're not we don't have we need more people doing maintenance jobs inspections and you know all these things to just to make sure that they're continuing to function well because again, there are health issues with nitrogen. And so sep septic systems are good, but they're the most basic. I mean, that's the starting point, mm -hmm. but they don't take care of those nutrients. So in urine and poop, there's a lot of nitrogen and, and phosphorus. Nitrogen is the one we worry about the most. If you get a lot of nitrogen coming out, 
um, there are two effects. One is environmental. It leads to algal growth that um, can smother and kill a reef. Um, and our reefs are you know, worth billions of dollars in all kinds of recreational value, in just storm protection, um, in all kinds of way, in fishing and, and um, you know, we depend on our reefs, our healthy reefs. So this is something you definitely wanna avoid. Kaneohe Bay, which I mentioned before, there were a lot of sewage outfalls in the 70s. And when they finally, under the Clean Water Act, took care of those, the bay really kind of bounced back and so did the reefs. Um, so we know that this works when you reduce sewage pollution, they, you know, the ecosystems have a time to recover. The other human health aspect of it is, and this is the latest kind of um, research you know, that's been done, is the only other place in the country that has more cesspools than Hawaii is Long Island. Um, and they've done a lot of studies there in the Bay that they have a lot of nutrients, uh, especially nitrogen from all of these cesspools. And it has completely devastated the, the shellfish industry, which was a major, major industry there. And it just, it collapsed because you couldn't eat anything that was coming out of the bays anymore because the water was so polluted and there was just a decline. There was die-offs, huge algal blooms, and then you have what are called like the red tides and green tides, which are incredibly toxic. So animals die off in vast numbers. And uh, so we looked at that and we're like, okay, we can't let that happen to Hawaii. Um, we've already have, you know, we've detected higher nitrogen levels in certain areas that I mentioned before on Maui and Oahu um, in our drinking water. But the latest scientific studies show that they lead to higher incidence of colorectal cancer. Um, and so this Which is, is ironic. Uh, yeah, right. Um, it comes back to haunt us in the same place, you know, that it came <laughs> from. So um, yeah, we really have to be careful because we don't want to end up, and we talk to the people in Long Island and they're like, make sure you tell your people in Hawaii that this is an issue. You don't want it to get this bad. And so that's kind of the message we're trying to, to share that like, we don't want this to get in our drinking water because- So what are they doing over there? Are they, have they banned everything and they're working on it too? If- Yeah. Are they in the- They're in the conversion stage. They're just like 10 years or so ahead of us. And so they've mm -hmm. done a lot of public outreach. The public now hundred percent supports this. You know, it's like 90% because they realize like this is- fresh drinking water and then coastal waters, mm -hmm. fishing, recreation, everything. Um, and it can affect the bottom line of the entire county and the state, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just like it could for Hawaii with tourism. And so they've set up programs where they help homeowners with conversion. And then um, a lot of states, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, New Jersey, Maryland, others, that when you sell a house, for instance, um, at point of sale, you have to make sure that a cesspool is converted. Um, and there are different ways of doing that. But one way, you know, we've got a bill is, you know, point of sale conversion. And we're working with realtors like yourself and others to try to find out what's the best way to do this. So that- What about the septic tanks? Um, having them, is there like a law of them being checked and all of that too? I don't actually know that. There's not, and so that's that would you know be something that we would do as maybe part of this law down the line. We don't have quite the Department of Health doesn't have quite enough inspectors. Um, they don't have a, enough inspectors at all, as a matter of fact, to go out and check every home. Um, so now we just have to start with the most substandard systems, um, cesspools, convert those, and then through that work for water program, train more workers to do inspections so that at every sale, if it, you know, if it's accessible, it has to be converted. If it's a septic system, they just have to check to make sure it's working. So um, could there be an outside company separate from the city or whatever to be the person that's inspecting? I mean, it doesn't yeah, have to necessarily you know, be like to get that certification. Exactly. Like in home inspectors we have now where you can yeah, contact right? now. I mean, they're just certified. yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. I'm looking at home inspectors too in regards to um, green home loans, right? So mm -hmm. they're going to need to um, 
to to check a home if they're going to be a green home like they have to meet a lot of things too so then there are now we don't have enough um people that can certify for green homes here in hawaii um so then it's like who do you go to if you want some kind of certification after building this home you know so it's like now we need to find people and it's interesting because hawaii energy does this on the energy side of things and they educate and advocate like you guys do they also have a pretty um a good amount of money um Mm -hmm. to carry them throughout the year every year to execute their plan um but it does it's at if if you um look at their model I don't know if you have or not but if you Mm -hmm. go onto their website and check out their like uh clean energy allies Mm -hmm. Um, They have all these vendors and people that are certified and then that are on that energy level, you know, probably like what you guys do, but it would be really cool to have, I would say something like that for all things sustainable right or everything for a green home not just energy because you know, like I would be like oh you guys should be there with all of your vendors and everything on the waste management side but it's not their kuleana. <laughs> so there's exactly. that seg- segregation. So, and our, you know, on our potty portal, we have something similar where we list all the kind of registered contractors and wastewater engineers. So like, if you're looking to upgrade your, your um, cesspool, you know, there's a, you first go to a wastewater engineer, they survey, get all the information about your property, figure out what kind of system is needed, you know, what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And then they'll put together a design and then you go out to a contractor to install it. Yeah. And, you know, like for right now, you know, there were some folks on the big island and, you know, part of the reason we want to do this is kind of a liability. It's kind of a home protection plan for buyers, sellers, and real estate agents. So there were some homes that were sold on the big island and the owners weren't informed about the cesspools on the property. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't understand it. And so they kind of spent most of their money on the house. And then when they wanted to do renovations, they were told they can't. So you can't do reno- major renovations on a home if you have a cesspool. You have to convert it first. And so then they were facing $30,000 $30, before they could even begin the renovations. And so they were extremely upset and threatening to you know, sue the realtors and angry at DUH and the legislators and everybody. So we just want to make sure that it's really clear what you have to do according to the law and that everybody realizes it's, it's in our best interest to do this. Um, yeah, and um, I don't even know, do we have cesspool disclosure statements? I know that, you know, oh. I think you have to check it, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's listed there. Yeah, but I don't I know think. if there's an actual attachment how Exactly. In our purchase contract where we have like um, now like the new one that came out with the shoreline right like your that disclosure that mm-hmm. just recently came out right so um, things like that where you're adding it to the purchase contract so it's very apparent and it's not something that comes up where you're seeing if someone filled out their disclosure statement properly <laughs> later after you've already signed the purchase contract to purchase, right? So where you're doing your due diligence, it's kind of in your face before you actually sign. So um, yeah, I would really um, like to see what the dis- discussions come out from um, the real estate side, because um, I definitely encourage um, us moving forward with this, especially in, you know, on the sustainable world. But I think overall, when anybody hears anything about what we're talking about, everybody's like, oh, no, we can't keep this going. You know, like this is everybody wants to take care of why and everybody understands it's going to cost something. So, you know, right. at the end of the day, I think, how are we going to help those who need the help and the funding to do it so it gets done? And um, those are the um, areas where I think we just have to put our our minds together and come up with a plan. And and, um, I'll be happy to help wherever I can in that capacity. (laughs) For sure. We appreciate it. Because we really, you know, I have a lot of friends that are realtors and I was talking to one of them and he's like, hey, you know, I like, I understand that little problem, you know, but I got to just represent my client, you know, and in, in the real estate deal. And I can't be worried about these other things that might slow down the deal. And then I said, well, listen, you know, you're a surfer. 
Um, you know, did you know that there are 53 million gallons a day that are leaching out into our groundwater that goes out into the oceans? And we have areas that are chronically polluted. And these are, you know, you can get dangerous, you can get Vibrio, there are all kinds of um, illnesses that you can get. Hawaii has twice the level of staph infections and four times the level of MRSA infections. Um, there are very serious illnesses that you can get that are associated with this. And it's not something that we can afford to do. And then once I kind of explained like the, the amount and that Hawaii is the last state, the only state that, you know, allowed these, then he totally, he was like, oh, that, that puts it in another perspective. We need to do more education and, yeah. and raise awareness of this because it's, it's, every, it's all of our issues. A lot of people are like, oh, I don't have a cesspool. It's not my problem. But it's like, do you like drinking water? Um, you know, do you like <laughs> swimming on the coast? I mean, it's your water. Your so <laughs> it is your problem at the end of the day, right? And um, I mean, we had a property that had, it was a big estate. And it was one of those homes that were passed down from generation to generation and things like that. Um, that property, it cost our sellers a quarter of a million dollars <laughs> because they had five cesspools. Wow. So um, we went into negotiations originally, right, and set up on a price with the intent that that it's there and they have the cesspools and that was mm -hmm. disclosed. But, you know, they were paying full price for, <laughs> for this really multimillion dollar property. Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, there was some wiggle room um, on negotiation and and it did end up um, providing uh, $50,000 per cesspool for yeah. the incoming buyer. Right. Wow. So at the end of the day, they'll hopefully there'll be five more. <laughs> hopefully they've done them already, but maybe not. <laughs> um, and there's a uh, minus 11,000, you know, five, five out of 11,000, but. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think one of the things that we have to remember is that you know, we're also looking for funding to help low income folks, you know, we really and there are going to be exemptions for people who are low income, in terms of like immediate conversion, and trying to find help. But, you know, with these big luxury estates, some people are when they buy if they're from, you know, if this is a second or third home, they can't believe there were cesspools there to begin with. And there's so much money on the table. It's like, yes, like, let's, you know, make sure that at least all those are done. I mean, think about all of the homes, you know, in the last year and a half during this market that we could have converted when there was so much money, you know, going around. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're looking at all kinds of ways to use some of this federal infrastructure money to help low to moderate income folks. Um, and we've got a number of kind of legislative efforts for this next session, but we really want to work you know, with the uh, realtors like yourself who kind of understand that it's an issue that affects all of us and, you know, we kind of have to work on it together. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. So um, let's see. I want to just go through my list of questions, make sure we covered everything. And one um, thing I forgot to mention. Sure, is, yes. Yeah, please. you're looking is, um, you know, there are basically three different options for converting these 88,000 cesspools across the state. One is at the, you know, extending sewer into certain areas. And so the, the city and county of Honolulu is doing that. They're going into, um, you know, Kailua uh, and Kahalu um, to extend sewer into certain areas. Um, and, then, and, and then they're doing it in EVA, um, but, how many extended, homes is that going to probably assist with? You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly how many, but it's a million dollars per mile, at least to put in sewers. And it's very disruptive, you know, when you have to go in the roadways and traffic is already, you know, at a premium in Hawaii. Um, so that will only do a certain sector. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way. And then the other way is individually, you know, converting them home by home. Um, to better systems, you know, that are going to reduce the pathogen and the waste, um, but also the nutrients and the waste um, and the nitrogen. And then there's a third angle that's more for like suburban areas, you know, that were still kind of close together, where you could maybe do a decentralized system for a community. Um, like how many in that community does it work for? You could do from minimum to, you know, maybe 50 
um, 40 or 50 up to like maybe 200. And so we're working so with like a townhome, like, I mean, I guess they're not, townhomes aren't really on those anymore, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, condos and townhomes, generally, if you're going to do that level of development, you have to Be do super. a wastewater system with it, you know, that yeah. you have to get that approved beforehand. So these are more individual homes. And so, um, you know, those, you could put those homes together. Um, like Waialua on the North Shore is an area where there are a lot of homes, all in cesspools, mm. bad water quality in certain areas, especially when it's rain, raining, you do not want to go in the water in certain areas of this island um, and across all the islands. And, um, and that's where you could have a system that could do anywhere from 40 to 200 homes. Oh, and wow. what's great about them is you can recycle all the water and use it for irrigation and get it back into the aquifer. They can clean it to such a level to R1 water that you could use it for irrigation of trees and um, and and. So, if you were to have a system like that, it would be covering, you know, maybe 200 homes. I mean, I know why Lua is definitely a place that has a lot of farmland or a lot of people grow stuff. Who ends up with that water? The it comes from that one system and that treatment that it all goes to, right? Yeah. You and can then do, is that an individual company that sets it up like if you were having Hiko do power, like they would do your, like there would be a certain amount of homes that would jump on the system, yeah. like they're paying for a sewer, you'd be paying this company to it's do it. It's a great it. question. It's like um, Pulico, you know, on the big island um, north of Kona, you know, they have a community association. So they would go into an agreement together and create like a, uh, what's called a sewer improvement district, an SID or a community facilities district, CFD. Um, and, or the county councils can co create it for a certain area. So it could be a city it. and county initiative as well, or it's actually a separate company. So it, it kind of, it could, it would need to go through the city and county and get kind of improved, approved. Mm -hmm. um, but then they would pay. So the, like the rest of us on sewer, we pay sewer fees, right? Every month. Mm -hmm. So what they would do, these models, you have companies that can come in, private companies, and they can do sanitation as a service. And so they have a contract where they're going to provide this service where you pay literally pennies per treated gallon of effluent of this waste. Um, they can produce clean drinking water that the community can decide what they want to do with it or the county. Um, we need this to go, you know, in such and such an area where there's a drought condition or for fire breaks or for orchard orchards, you know, or just whatever use they want. The main thing is to get it back into the ground, into the aquifer, so we can restore our drinking water supplies, um, because those are, you know, with climate change are starting to dwindle. Um, and so we need to make sure that we always have enough water, you know, for the future. And so, so it's where are these, these, um, I'm just starting to think about this, but like, are there any of these here in Hawaii already set up like this? There are, there are a few, um, like Hawaii Kai set this up when it was being developed. Um, and so there's a private wastewater treatment plant called Hawaii American Water that runs that and takes care of all the sewage for that whole area. Um, they work under Department of Health, so they have to go through all the guidelines, make sure they're doing the incorrect, but that was private. Um, and so, you know, there are like uh, 24 of these uh, across Hawaii, um, you know, private um, facilities. Mm -hmm. But we're working with companies that can even do, I mean, that's hundreds and maybe even thousands of homes. And then we're working with communities where you can do much smaller. So you can literally ship this out on a container. They're containerized units. This company we're working with called Cambrian, and they can be ready to go. You ship them out, and then all you have to do is get conveyance line to the, to the houses, which is difficult, and that's expensive in itself. But they can bring all that equipment to treat it, process it, and create this clean drinking water, you know, not drinking water, but clean water for irrigation and such. Um, and they can do it for no cost. So normally, if like the city were going to do it, and like on the big island, they need to rebuild a lot of these plants and then certain areas don't have any sewage plants. It's millions of dollars of infrastructure. It's so expensive, time consuming, disruptive, and the county's 
do not have this money, especially after the pandemic. And so this is a way where you can bring containerized units that are ready to go and all the county needs to do and the community is just hook them up. And how um, um, those containers that you're talking about, how many does it service? So that could do anywhere from, you know, again, 40 to 200. Wow. And then how far apart do they, can they be like, you know, the, you know, they they don't take a lot of um, space. And so that's the other thing. Sewage treatment plants are huge. They're a big footprint. They waste a lot of energy. These things are very efficient um, and they have something called a WEPA, Water Energy Purchase Agreement. So they can give discounted rates because they're getting some energy out of it and then also clean water. They're producing something valuable in a very, very efficient way. They can use solar um, to reduce the cost down to almost being, you know, um, I don't know if they can get quite to net zero, but very close. Does and the then, system smell like if, no, you know what I have, mean? How if you're in certain areas, you're like, oh it's, yeah, it's so bad over here. No, exactly. They, these are done. They're, it's a, it's a very new kind of approach and they can take care of the odors and everything. And then what you do is instead of sewage lines, sewer lines, which are very big and expensive, mm -hmm. a million dollars a mile, like I said, these are very small lines that can go under the side of the road. And so they just, you run them from each house into the system that you could put on a half acre and it can treat all the waste and produce clean water. Um, mm -hmm. And whereas that might cost, you know, millions and millions of dollars, maybe tens of millions of dollars for certain communities of a certain size, they can come in at no cost set up, start the contract. Maybe it's a you know 15 year contract, 20 year contract, and then the community will eventually own it. Um, so, so what about the land? Would the city provide land for a treatment center like this? I mean- Yeah, you'd, you'd have, have to have find to some, yeah, you'd have to find some, uh, land that the community or the state or the county donated. But again, on like a big treatment plant that uses a lot of space, this can be done in less than an acre and sometimes less than a half acre. So it can be very small. So if a company comes in and provides this, um, what is the cost, I guess, to get something like this set up? Yeah, and so then... it would be the cost of the conveyance line. So we're looking at Malaya on Maui. Okay. Um, they've got 10 condos that are right on the shoreline. Mm. In Malaya Bay, the water quality has just gone way downhill. Really? Um, yeah, the coral reef is like, we've talked to folks that have lived there their whole lives as, you know. Don't they have the that, bird sanctuary right there too? Um, I think further, yeah, further oh. down from there, um, there's a bird sanctuary. And so we're working with them in the the condo organizations um, and the aquarium there are really concerned about this because they've lost like 70% of their coral reef has just been, has been totally killed um, mostly by, you know, the effluent and then sedimentation. And so, you know, we could come into that community and for the cost of only 4, 4 million that the, the county would provide, council member King was trying to do this less than that that would be the upper, uppermost level. You could hook up all of the homes, bring in this equipment free of charge um, because they, it's a sanitation as a service. So you pay a monthly fee and then they could hook up all the homes and be producing clean water that we were gonna take to land nearby and do a windbreak and a firebreak and orchard and but potentially produce food, a food orchard with ulu trees. It would be gorgeous. It yeah. would enhance property values and your waste problems are totally solved. And it's super and windy then, right over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's super windy and there's a lot of sediment and this would also control the sediment runoff and you could really revive the bay like they did in Kaneohe. You could bring wow. back the fish and the coral reefs um, and the bird life and and it really is has a cascading upward effect mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, for sure we're kind so, of the bottom spiral down now we can need to go back up for the people that have cesspools and septic and it's kind of like they're not doing anything there's no like um it, there's really no cost to them every month right so what are we talking like with the system like this per se um that they're gonna have to be prepared to pay for now that they weren't 
paying for before. I mean, I'm looking for objections, you know, that people yeah, probably yeah. have against it, yeah. you know, regardless of the fact that it's the right thing to do. <laughs> right. And they probably live on the water, so maybe they can afford to. I'm not too sure. But I was just curious how much, um, since the system itself doesn't cost anything because they're charging that monthly fee, um, yeah. what are we looking at? I have no... You know, it, it really depends. I would love to give you a range, but it, it, it's most likely going to be a lot less than a, your sewer fee. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's comparable. And, and you, you bring up an excellent point, is that everybody who's on sewer pays for those fees. They pitch in and they take care of the problem. Mm -hmm. People with cesspools don't pay anything, but that's the huge problem. So there is kind of an equity issue here mm -hmm. of the people who are causing the problems, no fault of their own, but that's just the system that's there. Yeah. But they're not paying anything to help deal with it. So folks in the legislature, legislature, are off also thinking about another bill that would start with a very small cesspool fee to charge homeowners exempt if you're low income, um, you know, you wouldn't have to pay it. But a lot of people, this cross cuts across all demographics. A lot of people, like you said, live on the water, have multi-million dollar states and still have cesspools. And so we want to create a fund that those fees go into mm -hmm. that helps homeowners with the conversion but everybody so, still has water access i mean unless they're off the grid and doing water catchment so right. like with the board of water supply for example i mean i see i don't know these things i should know them um cesspools they're they're getting like those places are getting their water from board of water supply they're just not also paying the sewage fee correct yeah. so so unlike everybody else who's yeah i'm just like i guess for HECO, it's like there's this extra fee for that really pays towards white energy, for example, and everybody has to pay that whether you want yeah. to or not, you know, and it just goes there and then that helps co come, it comes back to you in a different way. Um, yeah. But I guess I'm surprised that there isn't an automatic fee regardless because you're hooked up to receive water and yeah. then you have to dispose of the water somehow. Exactly. And if you're not paying for that disposal, it would make sense that you would probably still have to. Yeah. Anyhow, and the good okay. thing is it goes back to those same people. That's the thing. It doesn't go into the general fund and get lost. This goes into a fund to help them with the cost of conversion. So it's like it's like Social Security. You're paying a little so that you have savings later on to help you down the road. Um, and so it incentivizes people to start thinking like, oh, I don't want to continue paying these cesspool fees. Um, and I want to do the right thing for my environment, for health reasons. I want to convert. And then there's money in this fund to help them with that process. Now, would that fund help with the amount of money they put into it? Or it's going to all owners of cesspools? So I think, you know, there would be probably limits. It would, it would be more focused on low and yeah. moderate income folks who really couldn't afford it without that. Yeah. Up, upper level people, no, it wouldn't go to help them. They can, they can. They'll just pay it. Them. Just, just get your cesspool taken care of. Get your cesspool taken care of. <laughs> then you don't have to pay behind the rest of the country. <laughs> You'll have to pay it later, anyways, right? Exactly. <laughs> no, it makes sense. I think it's a, um, it's definitely people don't want to spend the money, but at the end of the day, there's, it's the, it's the whole talk about the um, carrot. Um, and the stick, the stick, right? Yeah. And so, you know, there's a point where carrots only go so far and then the stick comes. So exactly. I think we're there at a lot of, in a lot of um, sectors in sustainability at this point yeah. to where we have to move to ledge. So anyhow. We're, we're moving in the cesspool conversion working group. We're also moving towards um, earlier deadlines for priority areas, you know, where there are a lot of cesspools and we know it's contaminating drinking water and coastal waters then they're going to have earlier deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, and some people are like, oh, it's 2050, it's a long way off. But if you're buying a new house now and you get a 30-year mortgage, you're running up against that deadline. So it's a problem that we need to solve with banks and mortgage brokers and loans mm -hmm. because you know it's like we need to make sure that there's a plan to convert that um, cesspool before right, the 2050 right. deadline. And then it'll probably be like I said, much earlier in those areas that are 
you know, in the priority areas. All right. Well, I think we've covered just about everything. Is there anything else you'd like to share? How can people volunteer? How about that? Yes. Thank you. You know, we um, had a, a wonderful uh, green realtor like yourself, Jackie, whom you've met, mm -hmm. who volunteered with us uh, for almost a year. And she, you know, she loves real estate. She loves what she does, but she, it just, she's a young person and realized this is such an important issue. Like this is something that we need to take care of. And so we had a job opening and she applied and we hired her. And uh, so we, we, we welcome anybody to volunteer with us. And a lot of it's public outreach, just kind of letting people know that this is an issue that we all deal with. Our reefs are declining, our water levels, you know, are going down and we need to make sure we take care of our coastal waters and our drinking water. So we have volunteer opportunities. If you just email us at info at uh, waivicleanwater.org, um, we can get you set up and we need help with, we're doing town hall meetings across the state to educate homeowners about their issues and help them with options, looking into financial options, technological options. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, events that we do and speakers and presentations. So we, we need help all across the board and then legislation. Um, awesome. We have a number of bills coming up in January for the next session and love people to help us support that. So, so yeah, in our Eco Rotary, I'm planning on having him come and speak and that will be open to the public as well. Um, and then I'm also um, inviting him to come and speak for our Honolulu Board of Realtors East Oahu Regional, um, but this will be in February after um, LEDGE starts up. So um, yeah, we're excited to get you in front of people so they understand what is going on. It's kind of been an out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. And once people, um, the blinders are off, they're like, what, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> Um, so anyhow, so thank you so much. Um, again, to visit them on their website is www.ycleanwater.org, which is waicleanwater.org. And um, I think that's it for us and it wraps things up. Thank you so much, uh, Stuart, for taking the time um, for Hawaii in general and for our clean waters. And um, thanks for listening. Don't for forget to subscribe to our podcast, which is on www.smartlivinghi.org. And then you can also follow us on Instagram at, at smart underscore living underscore Hawaii. And also like us on Facebook. So mahalo. And until next time, live smart. Hello. Bye. Mahalo.